Brother Michael, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Such a beautiful day in Cardiff today. It is indeed a very nice day. And uh, thanks for coming to see us and sparing the time to do so. More than welcome. Thank you for having me. Now, how did your journey to Islam begin? So there was a, a sequence of my journey to Islam. I was born in the city of Cardiff. Cardiff has got a, a long history of people coming from different countries, settling in Cardiff. And so the community which I grew up in was very multicultural. The school I went to, there was a number of Muslims, Hindus, Sikhs. So I was able to see Islam from a young age. I could see when they came in the day after Eid with all the new trainers and, you know, there was questions about where they'd been, if they'd been fasting. And so from an early age, I was starting to learn about Islam informally. So you knew of Islam and of the Muslims? Yes. Yeah. What attracts people to Cardiff? What's so special about Cardiff? It was a, it was a port city. Ah. So the sailors would come here and this was uh, where they would obviously do trade. And then over the years, they chose to settle. And the, the demographics of Cardiff is very diverse. So we're very blessed that Islam is not a new religion in this area. And I suppose that's why there's so much tolerance um, for, the, for the beautiful religion in this, in this area. Uh, what about your household, the environment within your household? So I, my mother was not particularly religious, never expected me to go to church, never had the Bible at home. My grandparents were a little bit different. My grandmother was a, a Protestant Christian. My grandfather was a Freemason. and they never expected me to go to church even never told me too much about christianity um when i was a young child i can remember going to a few christenings but there was not regular you know christian events but they, i suppose christianity was the religion i knew most about at the time we would celebrate christmas and easter and um the different festivals as as i was growing up the the key event for me was around about the age of six and my mother became quite unwell she had mental health issues she was, went into hospital and for a period of two years, I was in the care of my grandparents. My grandparents' parenting style was a lot different to my mother's. Um, they expected good manners. They had rules. Stricter. Stricter, yeah. And it, it, it was beneficial because it gave me structure. It pushed me in education and to always strive to be the best person I could be. At the age of eight, I was placed back in the care of my mother. And those rules, authoritarian parenting, went out the window and my behavior, should we say, changed, started to misbehave more. And when I went to high school, I was still doing well in education, but I started to get involved, should we say, in the wrong company. And over time, fell into bad behavior, such as taking drugs. And I was looking for, uh, I suppose, trying to find out my own identity at that young age. I was still very active in education uh, in terms of the sports. And I joined the Army Cadets at the age of 13. That was very beneficial because it taught me leadership skills, taught me about teamwork and... Discipline too? Discipline too, yeah. <laughs> and I, I progressed very well. I was promoted and I, I very much enjoyed... We would go away to um, summer camps and went to Spain on one occasion. Again, 16, i have done very well in education. I've done GCSEs, were of a good level, went to college, thrived in college, got the, the top student award and progressed to university. My, my grandparents were always pushing for me to get to that level. And I chose to do psychology because it gave me an interest of maybe finding out a little bit more about my mother and her condition. And also it, it, it was the subject which appealed to, most to me. What about your father? Where is he in uh, this equation? So my father was involved when I was a very young child, but the relationship for whatever reason didn't, didn't continue. And so he wasn't part of my childhood. Um, oh. I met him in the when I was 12, um, again, but he, he never wanted to be, you know, an active part in my life. My grandfather was always my father figure, and he was always the one to, you know. Your maternal grandfather? My maternal grandfather, yes. And then when I went to university, my bad behaviors increased, should we say, you know, the, the not just the drug taking, but the drug, the selling of drugs in the, in the local community. Oh, no. And I was, again, I thrived in that environment because it gave a sense of brotherhood. It gave a sense of um, your role models. Were, were you part of a gang? I wouldn't say a gang. We had close friends. We would, you know, work together. And my role models were the rappers or the, the footballers, as opposed to those who were striving and doing um, good behaviors in, in, in society. When I went to university, the first year I achieved C grades, never really put much effort into getting anything higher. 
and in the six weeks holiday I went uh, to a music event and that was the, the catalyst really of, of me trying to change my life. I took a, a copious amount of drugs and felt like afterwards what's the point of life you know it's um i was looking for i had that massive high and afterwards i looked at my life i looked at my childhood and there was a sense of i wasn't happy it was depressed there was a sense yeah definitely depressed and from there i can say i was trying to find there was a i was trying it was a birth of me trying to find out who i was as a person so as a, as a psychology student it's a perfect subject to learn more about yourself started to read more about philosophy looked into the different sciences and when you're looking into that area you are guided to the question of do you believe in a, in a god is there a creator where are you going to go after death it's not i never disbelieved in a god but i never believed i never had that i never felt it so through university i the second year and the third year i, I strived hard and i got good grades and I was still just, I went, I'd done an introduction to Buddhism course, attended a few churches. I'd never, so searching, yeah, you were searching. But I never really felt, never really felt anything. So when I finished university, my initial job post-graduation was I, I worked in a prison with other individuals who were taking um, you know, substance misuse issues. And I felt I could give back to that. And I, I noticed that they were also struggling with their identity and who they were. I continued my, my research into uh, religion and I suppose at the age of 21 I was living in an area which was predominantly Pakistani area and I would get up sometimes if I was struggling to sleep and I'd go for a walk around the, the local block and I would see them go into Fajr prayer and I would think to myself what, what drives a person to, to wake up and get out of bed to go to pray? SubhanAllah. So, Astaghfirullah, I had a girlfriend at the time. I asked, um, she, she knew I was interested in religions and I said, do you want to buy me the Quran? So she bought it just as, because I, I had loads of uh, different books and I read the Quran for the first time and that was the first time I felt God. There was... You read the translation? I read the translation. It was bought from Waterstones, a uh, local bookstore. It was the Oxford University Press, not the best uh, easy English to understand. Mm. But that was the first translation that I read and it had a big impact and it was certain Yusuf Ali's translation or Pektal? I'm no, no I, I'm not too sure which mm. I've read those since um, but yeah there's there's different translations that True. even with that translation I felt something and it was even from uh, Surah Al-Fatiha when it talks about guide us to the straight path I was curious what is the straight path you come at the Surah Al-Baqarah um, the book with the, which of there is no doubt you start asking yourself what, why is there no doubt and you continue and there were some ayahs which had a big impact on me, such as um, we only created man and jinn, but to worship me. All my life, I'd been focusing on my own self, my own nafs, my desires. And for the first time, I thought about, OK, maybe about changing my perspective. And then the ayah, which talks about every soul shall taste death. I reminded Kullu myself. nafs in the iqatul mawt. SubhanAllah. Yeah. Mm. So when I kept reading and it, it asks you to reflect upon yourself. It asks you to reflect upon who you are as a person and where you're going. Even with that, I, I put the book down and I felt the comment that someone said, what do you think of it? And I said, it was the scariest book I've ever read. The Quran. Yeah, because everything made sense in terms of it made me feel close to God. It reminded me that life is fleeting. We are going to pass away and what is going to be left but our our deeds. So with that, that was the trying to take an avenue down a different path. The Quran uh, made you feel serious, maybe, for a change about your life, about your future. The, the worldly life is just amusement and play. Mm. The Quran reminded me there is a serious aspect to it. So, yeah. Um, I started looking into the five pillars and six articles of faith and I already knew a little bit about it because of the, the, my childhood friends. So it wasn't completely alien to me. And I rang the local masjid where I was at the time and I said, do you mind if I come around um, to have a further discussion? Firstly, when I've rung mosques in the past for different reasons, they, they haven't always answered. Um, so it was amazing on this occasion, the person answered. And then within a half an hour, I was having a conversation with a um, brothers there and they were talking more about 
what Islam is and how the impact of it's had on their life. Allah paved the way for you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and on, on that day, they asked, do you want to become Muslim? And that was the reason I came to the mosque. I didn't want to say it on the phone because I still wanted to feel the situation out. And then when I went there, I felt comfortable. Everything was logical with what, they were being, what, what was being said. And I embraced Islam on that day, they, um, said the Shahada. They all jumped up, gave me a hug. Um, that evening, about 25 uncles turned up for, for food to, to congratulate me. Um, they celebrated you. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. Is, uh, you know, if you've, you've become welcome into the community. But was there celebration at home? Uh, I didn't tell my parents initially. I didn't tell my, my grandparents or my mother initially. Um, How long did it take you? I think it took a couple of weeks. In a couple of weeks. And what was happening at the same time was the, the support from the mosque where I was having at the time, they were typically uncles. There wasn't many youth um, that I was bumping into. And it was very good intentioned. But coming from a, the life that I was living to suddenly praying five times a day, get into Fajr prayer um, was, was a big change. And when I started opening up the conversation to my parents and with my, with my grandparents, especially my mother was fine. She was, she knew Muslim. She had Muslim. Um, like she, she didn't mind. She didn't mind at all. She said, whatever makes you happy. My grandmother was more asking questions because obviously she came from a Christian background. Do you think this is the truth? And then talking more about the Bible. And my grandfather, he, he was more inclined to, he, he would always watch the news typically BBC, ITV. So he had quite a negative impression of, of Islam. And he was quite forceful in his views to say like, you know, that um, what you thought I was doing was, you know, not in my best interest, you would say. So with the, the good intention support from the mosque, and then with the difficulties at home, there was a, uh, a back and forth between practicing and not practicing. And so you, you were having hesit uh, uh, some hesitation or? I wouldn't say there was doubts over the truth of Islam, but there was when you're when you have a girlfriend and you're going out on a Friday night and you're drinking and you're taking drugs and you're selling drugs to suddenly pick yourself up and put yourself in a mosque with people all behaving um, being nice to each other. It feels very alien to me. So it's, it's such a drastic shift, isn't it? And that drastic shift, like I said, the it has to be gradual. And um, so. What I noticed was... You still had a girlfriend when you embraced Islam? Yeah, yeah. For a, what was her uh, position? She, yeah, she, wasn't, she wasn't that positive about it. Mm. She had her own reservations. Um, and I suppose those, those pressures of people not being completely happy with your decision, it puts pressure on you because you want to, you want to please your family, your loved ones around you. Over time, I became stronger in my faith. I started learning more about Islam. And my life started to clean up in terms of my, my the relationship ended, my, my bad company reduced and, you know, stopped taking drugs, became healthy living. Um, what I found was I would go back and forth between practicing and not practicing. And the brothers would, you know, give the good advice to, to say, try and get it embedded in your lifestyle. And when I was practicing, I was more content. I was more peaceful, more productive than when I was not practicing. So the, the back and forth became less to the point where the five pillars was embedded in my daily schedule. This period lasted until when? Or how, how, many, how long was it? I'd say 2011 is when I took my Shahada. Up to the, about 2015, there was a, a big swaying back and forth. I went to Umrah in 2015, alhamdulillah. And being a white revert, in Cardiff, you go into the mosque, you do stand out, you're around people who are all Bangladeshi or Arab. Um, so when I went to Mecca and Medina, I saw the, the multitudes of different ethnicities and um, the wide variety of, of, of the Ummah. Gave you confidence. Gave me confidence and it, it, it gave me a sense of um, togetherness, she was saying. So this reminds me of Malcolm X. SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah indeed. When he went to Hajj. Yeah, it's a beautiful story. SubhanAllah. So came back in 2015 from Umrah and it was definitely an improvement in, in my deen and how I, how I felt as a Muslim. And again, went in 2018 and between 2015 and 2018, there was a less of a swaying. Mm. I started to develop 
great uh, um, confidence to go to the mosque and ask the questions. Good company of Muslims around me. Um, and so I was in when I went to Umrah, I came back, I, I felt that this is, I have to just keep, keep firm, keep steadfast. And there was a, I met my wife in 2016, but I chose not to get married at the time, even though, you know, the conditions were, you know, we, we liked each other. Um, but I, I was honest to say that my life wasn't where I wanted to be in terms of practice yet. Um, so 2020, I got married, alhamdulillah. And so four years? Four years, yeah. Mm. And when I got married... She waited for you. She waited for me. <laughs> or I waited for her. <laughs> good of her. Well, good of both of you. <laughs> when I got married, it was, it was very evident to me quite quickly that my wife was a very sincere Muslim, alhamdulillah. And she was would speak very strongly about her, her faith and she would bring it into her daily life and about the you know being good and avoiding any evils of the heart and so even though my practice was improving the inner um, change was supported by by being married and my now your wife was born muslim my wife's got an interesting story as well her father was muslim her, fa her mother was not muslim when she was born, um, her father didn't know much about Islam. So she can be classed as a born Muslim, but they, she didn't know much. Oh, yeah. subhanAllah. Yeah. Um, alhamdulillah. So she she's... grew up in an environment that was far away from Islam. Definitely, yeah. Um, and Allah guided her. Indeed. Yeah. SubhanAllah. So later, um, through, through the journey then, um, when I got, my, my son was born in 2021, and that was a time where I wanted to ensure that I was the best role model. And if I was going to choose three events, it would be the Umrah and getting married and having my son. These were the escalations to make me the, the Muslim I am today. I want to give my son the ability to understand the social issues he has in this society, but at the same time have his confidence in his faith. Um, so what I would say is before I was Muslim, I was asking questions and lost in, in the worldly life. And then when I came to Islam, there was a period of good intention, people maybe not understanding the background where I'd come from. And the transition was expected too quickly. And that led me to burnout. When I met brothers of a, a similar background and similar experiences, I didn't mind discussing my, my personal issues and they understood them and gave me good advice to take one step at a time. Because they've been through it. Exactly. And then when you're in a good place in terms of your, your practice. Um, marriage is a, is a very good step to take. And I, I thank Allah for the, the path he's given me. Um, I'm, a, I'm a social worker in my, my daily life. And it's a, it's a nitma, it's a blessing to have that role because I'm able to give back and help people. And in my, in my local mosque, I, I help the, the new Muslim group. Um, and we have a, a range of people who will be Muslim 20 years from six weeks ago. Oh, wow. I the same advice I give I would have given to myself all those years ago I give to them now is take your, take your time small changes and the questions of you know should we tell should I tell my parents how, how do I give up the drinking these questions have to come from the individual and so I look to Allah for for guidance in my life at all times and the you know everybody is striving to be the best Muslim they can be um and you know it's, it's it's a path which was now set down that I want to try to follow in, in the best way I can. So not only do I help the, non, the new Muslims, I give a part of the Dawah team. In Ramadan, we had regular events to welcome guests into the mosque. And this is a way of me trying to give back and bridge the gap between those who are born Muslim and those who are interested in Islam and trying to translate it in a, in a way that maybe they would understand. Now, since uh, converting to Islam, how has been your relationship with your family? So, when I was, before I was a social worker, and before I trained to be a social worker, I was my grandparents' carers, a uh, carer for five oh, years. Oh, you took care of them? Yeah, I was their, their full-time carer for five years. And you were already a Muslim? I was already a Muslim. Mm. I was, I wouldn't discuss it too much in the early days with my grandparents, but in the later days, I discussed it very openly, and they were more tolerant of it. In those five years of being a carer, you see... You see the people you love, you know, um, the life go from them. Um, 
And we had some deep conversations at near the end that, that they, you know, they, they, they were happy with the decisions I made if it made me happy. So, so I'm, and your mother, my mother's, she's always been fine with it. She's always been fine with it. She has her own issues with the world that we live in. Um, may Allah guide her to Islam. I give, I give her dawah on a regular basis. Um, but yeah, she's, she's always been fine that I've been Muslim. She asks questions. She, she loves my wife. She loves my son. Um, but yeah, I suppose she lives a life of still drinking, still climbing, um, looking for, for happiness on a, you know, the wrong way, should we say. So yeah, it's, it's, it's small steps with her, um, but in time, inshallah. Now I, uh, I guess from what you've uh, told me that the um, convert community in Cardiff is growing. We're very blessed in Cardiff. I, like I alluded to at the start of the interview, Cardiff's got a long history of Islam being here. And there's a very active Dawah presence. And there's also a very active um, organizations which care deeply about convert care. Now, the the organization, it, it, it just be weekly meetings to discuss the five p pillars and the six articles of faith. There's meals, there's team, team uh, bonding. Um, so it's growing and there's a need there to, to help those who are coming to Islam. So I'm very passionate about giving, giving back to, to those causes. And yeah, Cardiff is a very nice, beautiful place for, to be a, a new Muslim. Um, I mean, I continue to bring the barakah into this environment. Now, uh, also you uh, told me that uh, when you converted to Islam and having gone through a period of turbulence, probably, yeah. mm -hmm. You probably parted with uh, many of your older acquaintances. Yeah. Um, it's tough, isn't it? Yes, there's some some relationships I reflected upon that we were friends just through through taking drugs or selling drugs. We weren't friends. We were friends through business, um, or we were friends. We would just go out on a Friday night. There was no deep sense of friendship. So those friends, it was easy to leave. Those friends who you'd grown up for a long time, part of your childhood, I, we, we discussed Islam and not all of them were positive about it. And you have to make tough decisions. And that's for every um, individual in their life in this society where you, you have to make those tough decisions. There was other, other friends, though, that were very supportive. Oh, really? Um, mm. So I have to give that, that balance. And my one friend that I've, I've been my best friend since the age of 12 initially he was quite negative about islam and um, didn't understand how i fitted into it and at the time i didn't know how i fitted into it that's one of the <laughs> the challenges as a, as a as a revert is your internal dialogue because once you become muslim you're part of the community but internally mentally you still feel as an outsider uh -huh. and when people ask you the questions to do with you know um the creed of islam or the the legal theory or even acts of worship you're not going to have all the answers and you feel a little bit silly um because you want to give them the, the answer so they they understand why you've made that decision over time my friend has warmed up to me being a muslim um understands that i got prayer times and i fast during ramadan so yeah he's he we support he supports me in, in my journey and you're still on good terms with each yeah, other yeah we're still on very good terms that's yeah, very good yeah, yeah. I think it's it's really important to uh, maintain relations if one can afford to Definitely. maintain them. Yes. Because this is what Dawah is about, isn't it? It is, yeah. And may, you know, may Allah guide him to Islam. And, I mean, uh, this is it that from, I'm sure you see on the, on, the, on the internet, people who have been very far away from Islam have come to Islam and they're just like my life. I never expected to be a Muslim when I was a youth. That's child. why we never lose hope. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Well, Brother Michael, it's uh, been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum.